It was all a man-made catastrophe. We started to understand that the whole structure of the economy that these people had put together uh, was not sustainable at all. Look, I mean, if Maduro stays in power, there's nothing to do. Nicolas Maduro is defiant in the face of election rigging accusations in Venezuela. Aside from the claim that he's illegally clinging on to power, opposition parties accuse the president of widespread cronyism and corruption, which has brought the country's economy to its knees. Well, joining me is the Venezuelan economist Danny Baja of Brown University. Thanks very much for joining us, Danny. And um, part of Maduro's unpopularity is down to the decline in the standard of living in Venezuela. So how would you describe the situation there for ordinary Venezuelans? Well, you know, this is perhaps the only country that we know in recent history that had experienced um, a decline so big and so large in its economy that it's only comparable to countries that have been going through war or conflict or, 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 or any sort of... Um, horrible circumstances, with the exception that there was no war in Venezuela. It was all a man-made catastrophe that started very early on during the Chavez years, um, already 25 years ago. And, and just to give you a sense, um, even though there's no official numbers in Venezuela, the, the statistics office have stopped publishing official numbers for a while already, we know that the GDP, the gross domestic product, which is the measure of everything a country produces in a year, Went down, went down since 2015 um, by about 70 to 80 percent. So let, let that number sink in. Like the, the economy collapsed by 70 to 8, 70, 70 to 80, 80 percent. That's a catastrophe. And, and you see that in the day of today of Venezuelans, um, a, a mix of shortages of products that we saw starting a decade ago. Um, people not able, not able to, to make a living with their salaries, um, hyperinflation that was caused by the government printing money to try to keep up with, with, with the debt and all, its, uh, all, its, all of its um, uh, debts that had with, with, with foreign, uh, with, you know, with, with in, the, in the markets, in the international markets. So, so it is really a man-made catastrophe um, that uh, included as well, just to finish the um, the, the real uh, strangulation of the private sector, a private sector that is unable to keep up because of all the regulation and the persecution, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, well, you, you've given us a lot of things to think about there. So let's kind of break all of this down. So one of the things Maduro stands accused of is mismanaging the state oil sector, which is a key export, export earner for the country. So what went wrong with the oil industry? Well, you know, during the Chavez years, um, uh, since 2000 to 2013, uh, when he passed away, um, the, the, the feeling or the perception was that Venezuela was doing actually quite well. Um, the, the thing that is important to understand there is that the oil, uh, the price of oil was the highest it, it was in, in decades or so. So, so Chavez enjoyed the largest and, and highest oil boom in the history of the country. So, you know, anybody can really manage uh, fairly easily a country that is the has the largest reserves of oil and the oil price is above $100 per barrel. Um, the problem is that when the price of oil went down, collapsed in, in 2014, everything really came afloat. And we started to understand that um, the, the, the whole structure of the economy that these people had put together uh, was not sustainable at all. Um, the, everything was based uh, on the idea that they could continue to import goods, that they continue to provide social services just with, with a high, very high price of oil. Um, the reality was that when it was really, really dependent on the price of oil, there was no private sector to produce anything internally. Everything was based on imports. and. You know, this, this regime did exactly the contrary of what you learn on Economics 101, which is when you have good times, you save a little bit of that money for when the bad times come. What they did is not only they spend all the money, but they also indebted the country to levels that were not seen before. So when the price of oil went down, um, the country had a huge external debt that it couldn't repay. Um, and it has shortages of all the main products that were just based on imports. They just didn't have any dollars to continue to import, and there was no private sector to supply those products. 
So, so this was not only about Maduro, it was really a man-made catastrophe that started with the structural way that these people have been thinking about the economy. Um, it happened to ha it happened when Maduro came to power, um, and his uh, part of his mandate or his ideas was to strengthen uh, the fact that the state-owned company PDVSA, which was a world-renowned company, was also used as a political tool to provide social services, to do a lot of things that had really little to do with oil, and it lost a lot of the expertise that that could keep up oil production in a way that that, that Venezuela needed. Um, and just to give you one last number is that in its peak um, of, of the history of, the, of this of the Venezuelan oil company, Venezuela was able to produce and, and in particular to export nearly three million barrels of oil per day. Nowadays, Venezuela is exporting some somewhere between five hundred thousand to seven hundred thousand barrels of oil per day. So this is a huge collapse in the capacity um, of the state oil company. Um, surrounded by a huge economic mismanagement that goes beyond uh, the company itself. Okay, but this is all America's fault due to sanctions, apparently, if you believe Maduro and his government. Um, does he have a point there? I doubt it, um, and I, I, I very strongly. And, and the reason is that I myself um, studied this. And uh, in a few years ago, we published a study where we actually look at this claim very, very in depth. And we find that most of the indicators of the economy that that are alarming um, started to deteriorate strongly before the first sanction, sanction was uh, was ever enacted. For instance, infant mortality, which is a good measure of the social services in the country, the health services, had already um, gone up significantly before the first sanction ever. The number of calories that people can buy, consume with a minimum salary, just for subsistence already had declined significantly before the first sanction was enacted in, 20, in, in, in 2017. Um, all the exports of oil that we were talking about, the imports of food, the imports of medicines, all those indicators were strongly damaged even before the first sanction came in. So, I, I, you know, it could be that sanctions made it a little bit harder than it was. I'm not, I, I think it's a very difficult thing to claim empirically, rigorously, but the fact of the matter that we show is that the most of the economic collapse happened before the first sanction. And I think who doesn't acknowledge that is intellectually misleading others. OK, well, you talked about prices there for the average person and his government has managed to tame the hyperinflation, though inflation is still very high at around 50 percent. Have Venezuelans seen any tangible benefits from that change? Yeah, you know, I, that's something else I wouldn't give any credit to Maduro, to be honest. So I think I think what the, the way I see this is that there was an hyperinflation that started just because of the of the mismanagement, mismanagement. And, and, you know, again, anybody who studies some economics 101 understand that the central bank of a country needs to be independent. It can't be a ATM machine for a government. But what Chavez and later Maduro did, because they had so much difficulties uh, when the price of oil went down, so they, I, they they started actually asking and demanding from the central bank, which is completely captured by, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it's loyal to the regime, to start printing money so that they can keep up with buying things, with repaying debt, et cetera, et cetera. That causes a pre-inflation because that floods the country of currency that is not really organically needed. Um, the, the, the printing was so massive that it Actually, it was one of the highest hyperinflations in definitely in the hemisphere and even in the history of the world, comparable to other episodes of hyperinflation that will go into the history books. Um, it is true that it, uh, that that hyperinflation has gone down, but but I wouldn't give any credit to Maduro on that. I think what happens in these episodes naturally is that when the currency becomes so worthless, people really start in the black market or like you know behind the scenes using another currency. In this case, was the American dollar. So in de facto, the economy of Venezuela is dollarized. Um, everybody uses the dollar. So once you move, once the whole economy moves to a different currency that is not uh, under inflationary pressures, that in inflation will go down. But it was nothing uh, that the government or Maduro or that regime made that actually managed that situation. It was just the natural course of events when you have these hyperinflation situations. OK, one of your key areas of research is migration, and about a quarter of the population has emigrated. 
How has that specifically impacted the economy of Venezuela? Well, you know, I, I, you're right. This is one of the largest migration uh, and refugee crises in the history of the world. It, perhaps the largest in the hemisphere. We're talking about 8 million people that, that left the country since 2015, many of them in, in the region, Colombia being the largest host, but also many people arriving to the United States. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, uh, has many impacts in many ways. It has, of course, impacts I would claim positive mostly, but it has impacts on the receiving countries, but also it creates these networks in which people will somehow send money or send goods to their to their families staying uh, staying back home, which could help them marginally to, to thrive. But the big question here to me is like, what's going to happen now? There was a survey not so long ago um, that uh, among Venezuelans before the election that 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 said that 40 percent of the people of Venezuela, 40 percent are would consider moving out of the country if Maduro stays in power. So we're talking here about another 10 million people, give or take, that would be considering moving out that would put the total refugee crisis nearly at 20 million people. That's that's the largest refugee crisis since World War Two. Um, so, so this is a really uh, catastrophic scenario that we're facing if there's no quick resolution to the political turmoil that Venezuela is going on is going through right now. I just want to touch on something that you said there about remittances, about sending families, uh, people who've moved abroad, let's say to the United States or wherever, and they've got work there, they send money back to Venezuela. How important is that for the economy of the country? And for the people, are, are people very dependent on this this income from abroad that their families have sent? It's hard to really measure exactly uh, how important these remittances are uh, for Venezuelans. Often remittances are in kind, not really on money, but maybe a lot of people send medicines and food, the food that you can send um, somehow. So, so, so that makes it even harder to quantify the extent to which it is. And as, as we said, like the Central Bank of Venezuela, the government doesn't publish any norm numbers. So we don't really know the extent of how important this is. But intuitively, you could imagine that this definitely helped the country over passing this hyperinflationary uh, scenario, because as we said, a lot of people are um, relying on dollars, on U.S. dollars to, for their day-to-day -day transactions. And in, in many cases, the, the access to these dollars come from people who are already abroad. So, um, you know, the, there's a whole economy in Venezuela, which uh, I think that the government doesn't really talks about it too much, uh, in which everybody somehow has an access to a bank account in the U.S. Um, they use all these uh, websites to transfer money like Venmo, Zelle. Uh, which helps them th thrive and 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 they need to somehow f there's a whole economy to be able to find cash in US dollars to pay for any basic service or or good. So um it is uh, it's definitely the, the the presence of a large diaspora is helping um Venezuelans to go through these times with with, with access to foreign currency, but it's really hard to measure because we 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 don't really have good numbers on how big this is. Okay, I hate to do it to you, Danny, for this last question, but imagine if you were in charge of the economy in Venezuela, whether or not Maduro stays in office, what economic reforms are you going to go about carrying out to turn the country around? A difficult question, but I think an instructive one. Look, I mean, if Maduro stays in power, there's nothing to do. I think I think this is quite clear. Uh, if Maduro stays in power, um, is not the, the problem of uh, Maduro being at the at, uh, at, at being the president of this country is is goes much beyond the economic management. It it it, it has to do with uh, the fact that he has effectively taken all the rights from people, the right to choose, the right to think, the right to buy. So so it, it is impossible to think of a scenario of 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 a huge program to fix the economy when Maduro stays in power. So I will I will answer your hypothetical uh, thinking that Maduro is out of power and we have a normal government who is really keen to give back the rights to Venezuelans and to reconstruct the country. And I think there's there, there, there's there's, of course, uh, a lot of things to, to be done here. And there's a lot of people who have thought about this in detail. But the first thing is that you need to uh, find a way to restore the rule of law. 
um, where you have, when people feel they have rights and their rights are respected, the right to private property, the right to invest, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think you need to go go and 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 deal, of course, clean from corruption and deal, um, do all the investments you need to do with the state oil, oil company to be able to um, start producing oil, um, at least for, 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 for the short term, to uh, be able to, uh, for Venezuela to have income that can be used, of course, for social programs and um, as a proof to the international community that we can restructure the debt. That will be the third big program. We, Venezuela is going to have to go through a huge restructuring of, of its external debt with the help of the international community, the International Monetary Fund, and find a way to repay this debt in a way that will allow the country to recover. So um, these are three big things, uh, very hard to achieve, and we can go on with, with many more. I will just add a fourth one, which is important to keep in mind, which is the importance of the diaspora, of the huge number of Venezuelans living abroad in this process. And I think that a lot of economic research has shown how diasporas can be a key element in helping their countries of origin to, uh, to achieve higher economic growth by connecting them in terms of trade and investment with other countries. And, and, and I think I don't want to, um, uh, I, I think it's important to put in context the importance of, of how important will be the, the, the Venezuelan diaspora for this process. All right. Well, tough times ahead for Venezuelans if nothing changes there. So, Danny Baja, thank you very much for your expertise on that. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.